So hello everyone, I'm Yemisi Songo-Williams, the Knowledge Management Specialist for the TOPS program. And it is such a pleasure to have Dr. Dixon with us today for our first ever TOPS program, FSN Network Knowledge Management Task Force Newsletter Guest Interview. Now for this edition, we feel extremely lucky. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am about this because Dr. Dixon was one of the early thought leaders in the KM field with her book, Common Knowledge, How Companies Thrive by Sharing What They Know. And that book was based on a research study of how 15 of the most successful companies were leveraging their knowledge. And her work helped to develop the early theory which demonstrated that different transfer processes were needed to share different types of knowledge. And in her role as principal consultant and researcher of Common Knowledge Associates, a consulting firm which she founded in 2000, Dr. Dixon has continued to increase understanding about the expanding and increasingly important role that knowledge plays in organizational success. So Dr. Dixon, it's an honor to have you with us today and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. I am looking forward to talking with you. <laughs> so let's jump right in then. Please tell us how your love affair with knowledge management began. What attracted you to the field of KM and what has inspired you over the years to keep practicing within the field? Well, I started out uh, life as a, as a trainer and so teaching people in, in courses and workshops, things like that, but teaching individuals. Mm -hmm. And over time, I begin to think that um, teaching individuals, even though it helped them, didn't necessarily help the organization. Right. So that, that what we really needed to deal with was organizational learning. And so this would have been back in the in the middle of 1990s, mm -hmm. and I started writing then about organizational learning. And the most famous book that came out around that time would have been Peter Singe's book, mm -hmm. Fifth Dimension. Is that right? The Fifth Dimension. Yes. But, yeah, that was right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that idea that that you could you could really use the knowledge of an organization rather than just the knowledge of individuals, and I. I think one of my uh, analogies that always made sense to me was that you, I, I, I went to school um, at Kansas University for my undergraduate degree, mm -hmm. and Kansas University was well known for its basketball team. So this is a basketball analogy. Okay. <laughs> okay. So every person on that basketball team could be a great star. Mm -hmm. They could, you know, they could make they make baskets. They could have you know, great footwork. But unless the team worked together, unless the whole team knew what each other were going to do, mm -hmm. it wouldn't work, right? right? Mm -hmm. So it is that idea that the team has to have knowledge. And, and of course, what people did in basketball was that at the halftime or even certainly after the game, they sat together and said, okay, what did we do wrong? What could we do better? And so they created their collective understanding and moved forward. And that seems to me a lovely analogy for an organization. So that's, that's, uh, that's really how I got started, was really saying, you know, individual learning isn't enough. It's got to be organizational learning. Great. Thank you. And I'd like to take us back to this issue of collective uh, learning in a little bit. Yeah. But before we go there, so Common Knowledge Associates, the consulting firm that you founded, has been operating successfully for almost 20 years, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us how the internal knowledge management activities that you implement have contributed to that success. Um, I, I think the major, the major message that I had early on was this message that you have to know what's the nature of the knowledge that you're using in order to know what strategy to use to transfer it. Mm -hmm. And knowledge management started, which really was in the very late 1990s, 1998, 1999, mm -hmm. long in there. Um, the first idea people had was, well, let's collect all the knowledge, put it in a database, right. and then you know, people can, can come and get it whenever they need it. They, you know, they, they don't have to wait around for a training class. They can just come right in and get it. And, of course, that, that worked only very slightly. Mm -hmm. It didn't work nearly to the extent that people hoped it would work. Right. And so 
it was clear to me that if what you want to transfer is explicit knowledge, then indeed a repository, if it's organized well, and if you have a really good search engine, <laughs> will work. Mm -hmm. If you want to transfer that knowledge or through experience, then you've got to have a different methodology. Right. So that I think the contribution I made was talking about if it's this kind of a knowledge, then use this strategy. If it's this kind of a knowledge, then use this strategy. I think that's the contribution uh, uh, that I made. A very valid, great one too. So I'm not sure if you know this, but one of our main program activities at TOPS is our knowledge sharing meetings. And these meetings bring together implementers and researchers and donors from around the world for peer-based knowledge sharing and networking around food security programs. I know that you're a firm believer that knowledge is generated in the moment through right. human interaction. And that conference design and learning sessions are among some of your key interests. So we're moving into organizing and planning our next knowledge sharing meeting. What advice can you give us for maximizing the learning and the peer exchange and the interaction at our next meeting? Well, one of my favorite uh, sayings like, is, is to say, connection before conflict. <laughs> yes. And that's actually a Peter Block, uh, he sort of created that term, but mm -hmm. I, I use it all the time. I give him credit, but I always use it because it's so important. So I think one of the very most important things you can do is to get people connected so that they, they see that others in the room are like them. Mm -hmm. They're not some strangers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that they have the same interest, they have the same set knowledge set, so they understand who's in the room, because that's very important. Secondly, that you, you, by giving them and making the connection, you help them see that it's safe to share what they know, right. and it's safe to ask questions, and that's absolutely critical. Because if you don't help people get connected in that way, mm -hmm. then they will sort of make pronouncements, but they won't really they won't really get any deeper than that. Right. So that issue around doing something first, mm -hmm. and and I think that thing you do first can't be just a kind of an icebreaker. Right. You know, mm -hmm. There's a lot of silly icebreakers. <laughs> yes. But I think it needs to be both take longer than that, mm -hmm. and it needs to be deeper than that. Right. So that, that we ask people to say something about themselves or that they value about themselves. So you could say, you know, what's the uh, what's the best team you've ever worked on, or what's the most important project, or why was that project important to you? You ask people those kinds of questions that one give them a little bit of a chance to brag, or mm -hmm. they show themselves in the best light. Right. And you give others some sort of an idea about what their competency is and in what area. Okay. And now they're a bit more prepared to, to actually engage with, with each, each other. other. So we can make these connections within that space of the meeting rather than trying to make them, say, some weeks before an event. Yes, yes. Okay. I think it's important. I, I think making them before is really fantastic, too. But in the meeting itself, mm -hmm. I think it's necessary to take the time. Great. Thank you. So over the years, you have worked on assessing KM trends and driving knowledge transfer. And we spoke a little bit about this. You've been working on building the theory and practice for collective sense making, an approach which when I first read about it sounds so intuitive and so useful as well. Please tell us a little bit more about this and how do you see this working within the field of international development? So let me say first, that sense making, which we all do, sense making is is the act of making meaning out of um, data or events in order to be able to act on that data. Mm -hmm. That sense making is collective sense making is making that meaning out of that data and those events together. Right. So together, mm -hmm. try to make that understand so that we together can can act on it. Mm -hmm. So. That, that has increasingly been important to me, I think in part because, the, um, uh, because there's increasing work in nearly every organization around teamwork. Work has gotten so complex that it no longer seems like it can be done by individuals, it has to be done by a team mm -hmm. because of the complexity issue. So that ability to come together and make sense, it seems to me, is really critical. 
Now, in the international field, the, the difficulty I see is that people are so incredibly busy that they, they might write up a lesson or they might have the project director write up a lesson, but they don't sit together. You read us they, very well. <laughs> yeah, they don't sit together and say, okay, we just finished implementing, you yeah. know, phase one. Mm -hmm. Now, let's systematically think together about what we learned from doing that. Right. And, and I think that needs to be done in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, the, the after action review questions, I think, are useful. But whatever questions you use, um, NASA, who's great at doing this, mm -hmm. they call their system pause and learn, which I really like that. I right. like it with an after action review. Mm -hmm. But what I see too often in the field is, in, in, and this is absolutely true in international development, is that one person writes up the project results or they write up the lessons learned from the project and so all we get is that that person's opinion mm -hmm. and they've not set together as a whole mm -hmm. and tried to understand what happened because if you do something and i do something else i i know everything that i did to make that work mm -hmm. but i don't know what you did yes absolutely until, unless we'll talk together mm -hmm. about it so mm -hmm. that I think is critical, and and I think it's done um, it, it, it just not often enough. Yes, yes. I think the culture is certainly changing. I mean, through regular program reviews, through things like fail fests, I think definitely we're creating that space and those platforms to share properly what we know. So that's encouraging, and, I think. Yes, I think there is. I think there is more of it. And I think still the issue is around, can we make it a, enough of a safe space for, for people to be re really willing to say, yes. uh, you know, okay, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't get this in on time and that caused a problem. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's, that's a still a very hard thing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very safe to do that. Yeah. Uh, Amy Edmondson, who's one of my, my real heroes, who's mm -hmm. at Harvard, mm -hmm. she calls that psychological safety. And, and she, she explains it by saying that's the willingness to speak, you, you're willing to speak up because you know there will not be any retribution for it. I mean, the people won't, won't dislike you, they won't think less of you. you know, right? and, or you and don't. Getting, that's right. Getting yes. To that place where it feels like, okay, I am safe to say whatever I need to say Absolutely. is really a very hard thing. Yes, yes. And there are no implications for my project funding as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Uh, and so that really brings the question that we really need the, the funders to have that understanding as well. Right, yes. And I think they're beginning to. I think they're beginning to with a sort of strategies like refine and implement um, from USAID. I think they really are beginning to give the community a space to kind of improve and, and move forward. Yes, and not expecting them to get it right the first time. Absolutely. Going forward, what do you think the future holds for KM? What are some of the emerging trends that you see? What are some of the hot button industry topics uh, currently being considered by the KM community? Um, I think one of the trends is around openness and transparency. And we see that, uh, that this, you know, some people call it narrating your work. Mm -hmm. There's that, uh, there's that, um, that interesting phrase, working out loud. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, but all of that, I think, is about... Um, making what's happening more transparent mm -hmm. for others to see. And that, I think, is going to serve us very well if we indeed can, can continue to move it forward. So that's one big thing. And, then, and, and the collective sense-making, I think, is another really mm -hmm. critical element of this. Mm -hmm. whether, they, whether it is through crowdsourcing, and we see now many people, even in the international uh, development area, using crowdsourcing yes. to get, get ideas. Mm -hmm. So there's a... Um, there's this new understanding that um, that there is knowledge in the collective. That you know, I don't think people would say it that way about the collective, but, they, but that's what it is. There's knowledge in the crowd. There's, right. There's, there's wisdom in the crowd, mm -hmm. and we can make use of that knowledge. That's a really hard um, place to get to. Mm -hmm. So I think we're doing it slowly, but I think we are coming to that understanding 
that, that there is a, through, through openness and transparency. Um, I think we're getting to that place. Great. Before we let you go, Dr. Dixon, are there any final thoughts that you would like to share with our audience? One of my, another one of my mottos, I told you that the connection before content is a yes. model, yeah, is, is the, what I have to say to myself every time before I get up front of the room, is to let go of the illusion that I'm the only person in the room that knows about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's an incredibly useful thing to yes. <laughs> in the back of your mind all the time that you know that everybody in that audience knows and has an enormous amount of knowledge and that what we need to do is design for for getting that knowledge and and if you have to make a speech mm -hmm. then to make it like a, like a ted talk for 15 minutes and then draw on the knowledge of the, of the community that is absolutely very useful information for us cam practitioners Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to uh, spend some time with us, Dr. Dixon. It's been such a privilege and a very real pleasure to spend some time with one of the pioneers of KM. And to our KMTF members, please check out Dr. Dixon's website, commonknowledge.org, to learn more about her work. There's a wealth of resources on the site, which I find personally useful in my work, so please feel free to check it out. Thank you again, Dr. Dixon. We wish you all the very best of luck with future projects and please stay in touch with the TOPS program FSN Network. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.